It's about the problem. How big is the problem? Where is the problem? What are the emerging drivers? We want to inform sensible adaptation because our mission is to help people who are on the front lines of climate change and deliver on the promise of migration. All right, so welcome back, everybody. Richard Baker, founder of Collective Responsibility, here today with another episode of the Sustainable Ambassador Podcast. In this episode, I'm extremely honored to be joined by Dr. Coco Warner, who's the director of the International Organization of Migration's Global Data Institute. It's a group that plays a crucial role in implementing the IOM's migration data strategy by enhancing the availability and use of data to achieve stronger governance outcomes and also positive impacts for migrants and societies. You'll know that I've worked with migrants here in China and in the Asia region, mainly from the economic standpoint. But as as I've also been talking about this 1.5 degree, 3 degree, 4 degree world that we potentially might be moving towards, that is going to be moving a lot of people. So with that, Dr. Warner, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. As a starting point, would you mind introducing yourself and a little bit about the work that you've been doing? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Coco Warner. I'm the Global Data Institute Director. And that Global Data Institute is part of the International Organization of Migration or UN Migration. Prior to joining IOM, I worked um, at the UNFCCC Secretariat, so International Climate Change Policy. Mm-hmm. And prior to that, I was in research, kind of among the, the first generation of people going out and collecting evidence from people who are living at the front lines of climate change about how climate change is affecting them, what solutions look like, and what we all need to be doing next. From that aspect, what is the size and scope of the problem that you're currently seeing when it comes to, say, climate migration? And why do you view it as one of the most pressing challenges that we face? Most of us have thought about climate change is far away and not relevant. But what we've seen in the past two or three years even are more hot days. We're seeing crop failure. So the the issue of where we live and how we live, that habitability now in this decade, just just in the coming years, is already a pressing question. Let's say we go past 1.5 or we go to two or whatever the number is. Yeah. How does that drive migration? I will name four patterns. We know that today an increasing number of people are displaced not by conflict, but by weather-related disruptions. Another trend, this is trend number two, has to do with livelihoods. Mm -hmm. We know that many people in the world have livelihoods that are very closely linked to pastoralism, to agriculture. Those livelihoods are right on the forefront of climate change impact. We have cases in Kenya, for example, where within a period of less than five years, a small herder has lost the entire herd three times. And those herds are quite small, but it's everything for that family or for that community. Third, it's complex or it's complicated. Many people are living in areas where social cohesion has really disintegrated, where you have conflict. Let's look towards the Horn of Africa or towards Mm -hmm. Central Asia. We know those areas are plagued by conflict. One off season or one interruption of those vital food supply chains, whether it is raiders who come and burn the fields Mm -hmm. or whether it's just a bad drought, there's no rain. When those almost like the the straw that breaks the camel's back in areas that are already fragile, relatively small disruptions that might be related to climate change, then displace the fourth pattern we know least about, and that is potentially population retreats. There are some really big shifts that may Mm. make larger areas not as habitable as they are today. What is your role when it comes to understanding the challenges and communicating either the size of the challenge or areas of solutions that you think can be brought to bear? So one part of data for action is to understand displacement. So really understanding who's been up, who's been uprooted, who are they, what's their profile in terms of male, female, um, age group, and that data helps um, inform humanitarian action. UN Migration or the IOM works together with 
all of the UN system to bring yeah. these solutions. And our data happily informs about 88% of humanitarian action in the wow. UN system. We work with GIS experts to figure mm. out where people are, where they are in need, and yeah. how that overlaps. Since we're talking about climate change, those different layers of information have a really important spatial and temporal element because yeah. to deliver humanitarian assistance and to do so in a way that's efficient and cost effective, you need to pre position. You need to have your mm. food, your water, your supplies pre positioned. Right. And right. so getting that data and layering it with additional data, that partnership is super important. How much of this information is actionable versus foresight? Yeah. So that first thing is data that informs action now. Mm. And it goes very fast. For those of your of your listeners who are in the humanitarian space, it really is life-saving. Data for foresight is our second big area. That wow. includes short-term modeling, which is, is um, weeks and months, and saying, hey, we see these stressors kind of coming up, almost like a heat map. Indications are that we're going to need to be ready in approximately this kind of spatial area in approximately wow. the next period of time that helps inform my boss who then makes the decisions okay yeah. let's be ready here and over here it looks like kind of status quo we need to continue providing services but it looks like that's solid and stable so yeah. that's foresight in that way we're also doing modeling on climate change impacts and what that means in terms of exposure particularly spatially as well as those population characteristics so almost like vulnerable Ability. That's a yeah. little bit uh, more on a year, 5, 10, 15 years, but again, okay. so that we can be ready because our system is changing. And in some ways, it's changing mm -hmm. much more quickly with climate change than we yeah. had anticipated just a short while ago. Are there, are there certain things that are different about the data you're bringing in or how you particularly use it? Like, are the models totally different on a month to five year program? Like, mm. how, how do you bring, what, what are you bringing in and how do you use it differently for each of those, those major buckets? About 15 years ago, some very smart people at my organization, this was long before I arrived. Remember, I arrived like half a year ago. So what do I know? But other <laughs> colleagues know a lot. And yeah. they set up something called the displacement tracking matrix. Mm. And this was set up to inform um, humanitarian action. Okay. Um, and so we have 400 missions worldwide. Um, we're operating in 175 countries. Mm -hmm. And we have that data collection infrastructure. We have about 13,000, in some ways, like old school data enumerators. They go out with questions and tablets. They're talking wow. to the people. So we mm -hmm. do direct data collection. We also do um, observations at particular crossing points or along particular corridors. Um, but the thing that I love is that the data, the typical variables are sex, male, female, age, different uh, kind of age groupings, um, where people are coming from, where they're trying to go to, uh, what their needs are. There is enough overlap between those, those, those kind of standard indicators that allow us to join our data sets with the data sets of other actors. A lot of the insights come from marrying the data and joining the data sets and right. doing that joint analysis. What's the role of AI going to be for you and your data then coming up? Because yeah. I can imagine a lot of old school methods are going to be elevated and a lot of the insights can be drawn out. Like, are you looking at this in terms of how to better predict or how to better manage? or how to mm -hmm. preposition resources. So if you're thinking of data for foresight or modeling, yeah. um, machine learning is a wonderful complementary tool to primary data collection. And it's it it allows so many more parameters by magnitudes. It's it's incredible. But of course, those models deteriorate over time. Mm -hmm. And so I see great potential for using machine learning, which some of our colleagues do, to create models that help us understand what are we observing and what could be just around the corner. How how do your how do your models say reflect or react if you type in one degree Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius? Is that when it comes to climate change 
impacts and modeling. There's been two or three waves of modeling just in the recent past that have mm. focused on the question, how many people? Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because I come from the climate change space, the way that those models have been used in a policy environment have been actually not about adaptation and resilience and yeah. what you actually do about climate change. They've been really about um, the, the narrative around the need to change energy systems. Systems. Mm. So saying that modeling that, you know, 300 million people will be moving in the year 2035, who knows, has really been used as a, um, as a way to say, we don't want to go there. Hence, all of you countries need to change your energy systems. You need to mitigate. So what about the modeling the IOM is going to be doing? Where are we going to contribute? Mm. What I'm advising our teams is not to focus on the question how much how, or how many people. Our modeling is going to look at spatial exposure, mm -hmm. population characteristics and vulnerability, and really focusing on questions like where and maybe when questions about how and mm. what are the drivers and how could drivers combine those types of questions really are geared towards again that data for action we want to inform yeah. sensible adaptation and building resilience because our mission is to help people who are on the front lines of climate change and deliver on the promise of migration. With that in mind, how do you approach telling the story of your data? What's the data or what's the story that you actually find people go, I've got, I'm hooked. Tell me what I need to do. So my sense is to tell the global data story of migration. It's about the problem. How big is the problem? Where is the problem? What yeah. are the what are the emerging drivers for visualizing that maps histograms seem to be workhorses of visualizing data. What are some of the solutions? And there, what you just said, um, pictures of people, maybe quotes. Sure. I've heard from some of our um, frontline communities that showing right. pictures of children suffering, you don't want to show that. That's not helpful right. Right. from their perspective, but showing the solutions through the eyes of people, um, mm -hmm. having, for example, internally displaced people, we've been asking them, what do solutions look like for you? And then just having them say, it looks like like integrating into the community. It looks like having a stable housing mm. situation, or it looks like being able to participate, those kinds of quotes. And there are probably some really wonderful visualizations as well. Mm -hmm. And the third part, what are the results? Because every, mm. every story has a problem and then the struggle to find the solution mm -hmm. and it has an end. And we want to show right. what are the results that we want to build together? Because a lot of this is the future that we're building together. And so part of that is showing a future that we want to build together. Where does your passion come from when it comes to helping individuals? What's a personal story you have around this data? Because I think it's it's very easy to get lost in the data. It's just, it's numbers, it's bar charts. I was in a refugee camp in 2011 doing empirical research, some of the first empirical research on climate change impacts and people on the move. Mm. And as part of that, we were doing a focus group discussion with women. And we were right out in some Somali land right at the border between Ethiopia and Somalia. And it a big drought was, was breaking. And that particular camp was receiving about 2,000 people a day coming over from Somalia. So they were, they had refugee status and they were coming because of the drought. But on the margins, three women came up to me and um, they shook my hand, but in my hand, there was a tiny piece of folded paper. It was an envelope. Mm. And the woman, she, you know, we did the kind of kissed each other on the cheek. It was <laughs> looked like it was the, the kind of way to greet people. Mm. But she whispered in my ear, could I deliver, could I put that letter in a mailbox and, and get it sent? Some of our colleagues in the camp saw that interaction. They pulled me aside and the colleague told me, I know you mean well, but you cannot take that piece of paper. There's yeah. a protection risk. And it, it felt really sad. And I recognized as someone who was collecting data and analyzing it, mm. I felt 
sad mm. because you're with people who are facing very difficult situations. And so from that, in talking with our teams, we decided that we would do the very best that we could with the data that we were gathering to tell the story of the people and hoping that somehow together we can be a force that will bring the change and really help people on the ground. How does an interaction like that drive you? Every day you meet people who care, mm. who also are very realistic about the challenges in the world and yeah. who are unflappable. They, you, you just can't daunt them. They want to work smarter and try this angle and that angle and bring everything that we have to bear um, mm. to be positive forces. And I just can't resist it. I think it's so exciting <laughs> and it's a privilege to be part of it. Realistically speaking, how, how big are these challenges and how do you see past them to energize your teams and to keep working on this? It's not like we can stop. We live on this planet and <laughs> you work with people who are dedicated and willing to work. And so that's the work ahead. We will navigate this together. And it is really important that we do that because come whatever comes, we have to navigate it. And it's better if we do it through the best of humanity, which is cooperation, mm -hmm. using our, you know, using our noggins and yeah. also our hearts mm -hmm. and um, bringing everything that we have to bear so that we maintain that stability and keep building together. So as a last question, though, we're moving together. What is some advice you'd have for young professionals or students who would follow in your footsteps through the UN system, through these issues of climate change, leveraging data for big audacious goals like what should they be doing now to learn what skills should they be gathering so on the practical thing build build skill sets <laughs> Um, for, for youth who are, let's say, at university or kind of at an early point in their career, build the data skill sets. Um, using all yeah. of these new, new technology tools, bring those to bear. It's not so much about the degree, it's about the actual skills that you have. So build those skills and, and come yeah. and do internships with us. Yeah. Um, another is to be collaborative. Build, right. bring your right. skills and, and collaborate with other teams super, super important. And the third is philosophical. You'll see a lot of gloom and doom. And it's mm. true. We have really, really hard challenges ahead. But imagine that you were you and the year was, you know, 1919. You'd be facing challenges in the coming 20 years. And we... 1919, you had a pandemic sweeping across the world. You had World War I that was followed by devastation in World War II. And it's in some ways really might feel like that. We have very big changes ahead, but we will navigate it together and we will come through it and we will continue building together.